How's it going everybody? So in this video, I'm going to quickly go over what I believe are the five phases of healthy nutrition. So each phase can actually be used together with other phases. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, one step after another type of thing, a hierarchy of some sorts. But generally speaking, um, people do start off at level one and then eventually get to level five. And it does uh, a lot of times um, go in order from beginner to more advanced, but typically people still use um, principles from each level, uh, even when they get into more advanced stages, and sometimes people use um, the, later, the later stages earlier on. So everyone's journey is gonna be different, but uh, essentially here are the five levels, and I believe that they're all equally important to an extent. Um, and it just depends on what your goals are and what your what health problems you might have and uh, what's the most important thing for you to improve using nutrition in the first place. So level one are just the basic uh, principles, uh, things that are taught by the mainstream, uh, the mainstream health organizations like the American Heart Association and American Dietetics Association and then the main the, the fitness industry and stuff like that things like if it fits your macros uh, caloric restriction uh, and basic macronutrient percentages um, so first of all there are actually a lot of studies I posted dozens of studies that have actually shown uh, greater fat loss on a ketogenic diet compared to calorically restricted high carb diets even when the ketogenic diets are um, have unlimited, unrestricted calories, um, you can find me on Instagram, Keto Conqueror, Conqueror with a K, um, and I actually have like four of those studies highlighted. Um, but I posted dozens and dozens of studies. The reason why I bring this up is because number one, uh, caloric restriction is not necessarily necessary. For fat loss, it's just that um, the general consensus in the mainstream, everyone is taught this, so everyone repeats this without actually like uh, searching for it. I saw recently there was um, uh, some guy on the on the National Academy of Sports Medicine's YouTube channel who claimed that uh, ketogenic diets don't provide better fat loss than calorically restricted diets. Um, and it sounds to me like he just hasn't actually like looked for these studies or researched it. Um, a good YouTube channel that um, provides a lot of different studies for this would be uh, Ryan Laurie's channel. He's a PhD in um, exercise science um, and he wrote the book The Ketogenic Bible along with another well-respected PhD researcher in the field. Um, and this video has nothing to do with like ketogenic diets, but I'm just pointing out that this whole calories in versus calories out thing, it will produce fat loss um, at the expense of muscle loss as well. It, it'll produce overall body mass loss in general, both fat and muscle. Whereas ketogenic diets, if done with adequate protein, which most people don't, um, you can actually, it's actually muscle sparing. Uh, and it's been shown to recycle BCAAs in, in the bloodstream and have a significant muscle sparing effect, um, whether cal calories are restricted or not, but especially when calories are restricted. But even when calories are not restricted, you're able to lose body fat and, um, the, you know, you're able to lose body fat. Uh, anyway, um, I suppose I can cite those studies down below in the description just so people can see them because most people are not aware that these studies even exist. They're just repeating what they've heard over and over again. Um, anyway, um, level one people will get triggered by what I just said because they're not, they haven't reached level four where they actually study the, the scientific literature to find out what's true and what's false. Um, but uh, yeah, weight loss is not necessarily good. If you're losing lean mass at the same time as body fat, um, yeah, I mean, you kind of want your lean mass. And so if there is a way for you to lose body fat without losing muscle mass, which there are ways, 
whether you want to admit it or not, um, then that's going to be a lot healthier than losing overall mass in general. The other thing is cal calorie restriction. Um, people have to continuously lower their, or erase their caloric deficit. So they have to continuously restrict more and more calories over time in order to continue losing weight. And what happens is a lot of people, especially if they're exercising vigorously at the same time, uh, especially over the long term, and you see this a lot with bikini competitors and physique athletes and things, um, but even in general people who are trying to lose weight, they can actually hit a plateau where essentially for whatever reason, a lot of people claim it has to do with uh, down regulation of thyroid hormone and things of this nature. They hit a, a plateau where it doesn't matter how much they restrict calories anymore, um, they can't lose weight no matter what. And that has to do with the fact that they're literally starving their body in order to uh, pull energy from the fat stores. And one of the things about ketosis that people for some reason don't seem to get through their heads is that a ketogenic diet is called, it's called a ketogenic because it literally uh, starts to burn your own body fat directly without caloric restriction. Um, and it breaks down your body fat into ketone bodies and it can also convert um, triglycerides into um, into glycogen over time. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, free fatty acids and uh, triglycerides can be converted into uh, glycerol and into glycogen over time after you keto tap for a number of weeks. Um, anyway, the point is uh, there are dietary methods that you that can you can burn fat with and keep your lean muscle without even needing to restrict calories. So at, at level one, you don't know this because you're basically just um, looking for all these gurus to, to teach you things. And if you look on Google search for, or if you look on YouTube for like, uh, you know, how to burn body fat and this and that, you'll find mostly Lane Norton and Omar Esof and all of these people that just kind of like repeat the same mainstream dogma, um, which it works, don't get me wrong, but it's just not the most efficient way to do things. Um, and so, you know, and, and people will convince you that it's the only thing, that's the be all end all. And there's people who get angry and they leave angry comments down below um, anytime you disagree with the status quo. And it's just so sad because there are actually studies that show um, the opposite. There's dozens of studies that show the opposite. And if I'm not a total douche, I will post them down below in the description. But I, knowing me, I'm pretty, I tend to never do that for some reason. But I do have them highlighted on my Instagram. And I will be posting more, more studies as I, I have been for the last year on my Instagram. So go check that out. Keto Conqueror with a K. Anyway, um, and yes, I am biased towards ketogenic diets simply because they are extremely effective for um, improving all of your blood markers on uh, general health exams at the doctor's office, reversing diabetes, uh, raising HDL, uh, lowering triglycerides, uh, reversing fatty liver disease, um, and obviously um, drastically improving your body composition without compromising lean mass. And not to mention, you know, they have extreme mood boosting benefits, uh, which is why I follow it. So level two, focusing more on whole foods uh, and cutting out all the main junk that causes disease. So um, in level one, when people are focusing on calorie restriction and this and that, uh, typically you'll hear like, oh, I can eat, you know, they eat Pop-Tarts or they eat junk food or they'll just fit, you know, a lot of processed foods into their macros as long as they hit their calorie goal and that doesn't have to be the case. I mean, you can calorically restrict um, in all of these levels. And caloric restriction has a lot of benefits um, outside of just, you know, starving yourself to death, <laughs> outside of just, you know, uh, losing weight and things. But um, focusing more on whole foods is not something that people typically focus on in level one. 
Uh, most health gurus, they just, you know, they preach the if it fits your macros type of model. And the thing is, um, for health markers, calorically, cal calorie restriction will improve a lot of health markers, um, but you can still have high triglycerides if you're eating enough carbohydrates. Um, even though caloric restriction will lower your triglycerides quite a bit, you can have a high fasting blood glucose if you're eating if, if uh, you're eating a high carb diet and calorically restricting. But the big thing here is HDL. Your your HDL your blood, uh, HDL in the blood will most likely go down, uh, especially because people who do caloric restriction, um, because fats are so calorically dense. There's nine. Uh, nine calories per gram of fat versus four grams per gram of carb and or you know four calories per gram of carb and protein people restrict fat first and um, increasing your HDL first of all has a number of benefits um, the main one the main one so obviously there's a lot of evidence that shows um, the higher HDL the lower your your risk of cardiovascular disease and there really is no strong evidence whatsoever for um, LDL, high LDL causing heart disease. Um, I've made videos about this where I pointed out the obvious flaws in the studies that vegan zealots post, um, such as extremely low sample sizes and um, studies done on statin drugs, etc. But uh, anyway, um, the longest living people in the world, for one, most, most centenarians, that's one thing they all seem to have in common, is an extremely high HDL. And essentially, um, anything over 40 is gonna be okay. Uh, over 50 is better, especially for women, it's essentially you have your HDL over 50. Um, and if you have your HDL level 60 and above, then you're at extremely low risk for heart disease, especially if your triglycerides are low. Uh, and so I bring that up because uh, restricting calories is going to probably give you, especially if you're eating processed foods, um, something that actually um, lowers your HDL are things like polyunsaturated omega-6 oils, but especially uh, trans fats. Trans fats dramatically decrease your HDL. So, and then typically when you're eating mostly whole foods um, and you're cutting out the main junk that causes disease. So you're gonna be cutting out things like polyunsaturated omega-6 oils. Well, maybe not, because that is, you, you could call that a whole food. Uh, but trans fats and, and things like that. Uh, and also cutting out um, processed carbohydrates. You know, white refined flour and things like that. For me, I, I consider white rice a wild card because a lot of people, uh, for a lot of people, that's one of the the easiest digesting carbohydrates you can eat, and brown rice and other whole grains tend to cause digestive problems for a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot. Um, but keeping your refined carbohydrates low and sticking to whole food carbohydrates is also going to, um, at the very least, it's not going to lower your HDL. So you should have a better HDL. And lower triglycerides too, um, because typically whole uh, carbohydrates, um, they, they have a less, they have less of an impact on your triglycerides and your fasting glucose, although they still raise them to an extent um, because whole foods does not mean low glycemic load carbohydrate. But when you cut out all the main junk that causes disease, disease typically you're gonna be cutting out most of the stuff that increases triglycerides, increases fasting glucose, and lowers your HDL. Um, so a lot of people, when they combine caloric restriction with whole, a whole food diet, they can reverse diabetes, they can lower their triglycerides. Um, you know, a lot of great things can happen when you just eat less calories and make sure all those calories come from whole foods. Um, you know, and so the, the reason why people can reverse diabetes on a whole foods diet with that's calorically restricted is because um, caloric restriction lowers fasting blood glucose and whole foods generally cuts out a lot of high glycemic load carbohydrates, and those are the things that cause disease. Um, and since your body is, is starving of energy, of energy source, it's going to become more insulin sensitive in a calorically restricted state. 
but mind you, ketogenic diets do the same thing. Um, but they tend to raise HDL because they're so high in fats. Calorically restricted diets tend to be pretty low in, in fats, especially the, the fats that actually raise HDL. Uh, and so in level three, we're going to be talking a lot more about these things in particular. So level three, um, the, the basics of focusing on the types of foods consumed. Um, so essentially, you're going to be looking at the different types of, mon, uh, of, of fatty acids, monounsaturated fats versus polyunsaturated omega-6. Uh, typically, polyunsaturated omega-6, um, the re these are inflammatory. There's a couple reasons why. Number one, they, they seem to re uh, lower your HDL levels. Um, and they definitely do um, increase your need for omega-3. Now, a lot of people say, oh, there's a ratio, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is important. But the, what's actually going on in the body, to put it in layman's terms, is um, when you eat more omega-6, polyunsaturated omega-6 fats, um, what happens is it actually decreases the conversion of ALA into, um, I believe, uh, DHA or the active forms of omega-3 that your body tends to use and ALA is a plant form that most vegans get from flax seeds and Typically on a vegan diet the fats that they're going to be consuming are going to be very high in omega-6 and that is um, a big reason why um, That's a big concern and so the problem is not like oh like ALA is poorly poorly converted in general the thing is some people have genetic polymorphisms that prevent them from converting ALA. Same thing can be said for things like vitamin A. But um, what's more common is that people eat uh, too many polyunsaturated omega-6 fats that, can, um, that tend to hinder ALA conversion into DHA, EPA. So uh, anyway, um, in level three, you will be focusing on these things, you know, monounsaturated oils, uh, choosing low glycemic load carbs versus high, because even on a whole foods diet, you can be consuming things like bananas and whatnot. A lot of people can consider uh, date, date sugar a whole food and stuff like that. Um, and low glycemic load is very important, um, mainly because, uh, so first of all, what is, low, what is glycemic load? Essentially, glycemic load takes into consideration um, both the amount of, of glucose that gets put into the blood from the food and um, how long it takes to raise blood sugar. So a glycemic index just takes in consider, into consideration um, how long it, uh, it takes uh, to elevate that blood sugar. So you know, the, the higher the glycemic index, like the quicker the, the blood sugar spike. The problem is if you have a food that is extremely low in carbohydrates, like broccoli, for example. And let's just say that for some reason broccoli increases, um, you know, blood glucose immediately. Well, shit, you're only getting like two grams of net carbs <laughs> in that serving of broccoli. So how dramatic of the impact is it going to have on insulin levels? Probably not much. Um, especially when you consider, um, you know, eating uh, high glycemic index carbohydrates with protein and fat slows the digestion, the digestion, which um, can actually slow the rate in which blood glucose is elevated. Um, on the other hand, if you eat a large amount of carbohydrates, um, and all of these are high glycemic index, especially if they're high glycemic load, you're gonna be in a food coma pretty soon, regardless of, of what foods you combine it with, especially if you're overeating, because that tends to increase your, uh, that, cause, that tends to cause crashes as well. Um, so choosing low glycemic load carbohydrates is a wise idea, um, and also um, looking into uh, restricting ca uh, carbohydrates just to make this even more effective. But that, that's actually more of like a level four thing. <laughs> so on level three, you're just, we're, you're just trying to eat better types of food, you know. Uh, brown rice instead of white rice, um, but, no, but understanding that even brown rice has a higher glycemic load than something like broccoli <laughs> and, or berries even. 
or bananas have a higher glycemic load than something like blackberries, you know. Um, and so most people will find that they feel so much better once they get to level three because uh, they're balancing out their fatty acids, they're eating more DHA and EPA, animal source omega-3, which is very important. Um, at the very least, if you're vegan, get an algae supplement. Um, don't rely on flax alone. And you're making sure you get all your essential nutrients as part of level three. You're eating more omega-3 from, uh, from animal fats. Choosing low glycemic load carbohydrates instead of high. Um, which typically means more fiber and more um, vitamins and minerals without the blood sugar spikes, right? Because something like a banana or even an orange, you can eat a large amount of these and get a lot of your nutrients. A lot of people say, oh, bananas and, and oranges don't have a lot of nutrients in them. That's false. Uh, something like six oranges will give you your, uh, obviously, 100% of your daily value of vitamin C. It'll give you 100% folate and 100% vitamin B1. These are very, and even uh, things like potassium and magnesium. Um, and bananas will do the same thing, 10 bananas. The problem is that's a lot of carbohydrates and, and um, these, t these tend to uh, cause a lot of um, uh, blood sugar crashes for a lot of people. So when you choose something like broccoli, cauliflower, avocados, you know, um, these are low glycemic load to the extreme, and even things like blackberries and whatnot, or kale, right? So these things can actually provide you a large amount of nutrients without the blood, the high uh, glycemic load. Uh, monounsaturated oils are going to raise your HDL. Um, keeping polyunsaturated oils low, polyunsaturated omega six will will also keep your uh, raise your HDL. Uh, choosing low glycemic load carbs will actually lower your triglycerides and lower your, your fasting gl blood glucose, regardless of caloric restriction, and uh, probably increase your HDL just because high glycemic load carbs tend to lower them. Same thing with um, omega-6 oils tend to lower HDL. Uh, eating a high amount of EPA and DHA omega-3 is going to drastically increase your HDL as well. Um, and making sure you get all the essential nutrients is just going to prevent vitamin deficiencies. Although a lot of a lot of these uh, RDAs recommend daily allowance of nutrients are disputed, and many people believe that it it all changes depending on the macronutrient profile of your diet. For example, um, a lot of people believe a low carb diet you don't need as much vitamin C or don't need as much vitamin B1 or folate because these nutrients are claimed to uh, be used to process carbohydrates and since you're not eating much carbohydrates at all, you don't really need as much. But anyway, it's probably a good idea for you to track your food chronometer and just make sure you're getting your essential nutrients if you're not intolerant to these foods, you know. So that's level three and I think level three is a good place for most people to be. Um, I think get being stuck on just eating whole foods and calorically restricting and stuff will will do uh, will put a lot of people in limbo land and not get them very far and could even potentially harm them, especially when they are so strict about caloric restriction and they don't realize that there's actually ways of there's better ways to do things. Anyway, uh, level four and level four is more where I tend to hover around uh, and I can find everything, all of these things, um, besides, uh, but not caloric restriction. I make sure I get in, uh, more cal calories just because I'm so active. Um, fun fact, I actually burn uh, about a thousand more calories than I eat every day. Um, and I am on a ketogenic diet, but yet my body weight seems to stay the same. And I track everything. I track my real-time heart rate with, uh, with a heart monitor. Uh, which estimates the amount of calories based on um, my my heartbeat. It's pretty accurate, much more accurate than calculators you might use and things like that. Professional athletes use uh, heart monitors around strapped around their chest uh, to do the same thing. And I haven't lost weight. I don't lose a lot of weight even if I'm burning a thousand calories a day consistently, but I will feel pretty crappy unless I get enough, unless I eat the same amount of calories I burn. Um, anyway, level four is studying the scientific literature to really find the truth of disease. 
So the thing is, um, oh, and then also choosing a diet that produces the best health and well-being for your body. Um, another part of this is going to be like food, food intolerances. So a lot of people, um, they have these really strict rules on nutrition, but they don't, they fail to realize that they can't apply them in the real world because many people like myself have very severe food intolerances and I've tried everything, probiotics, prebiotics, I've tried fermentation, sprouting, uh, chewing my food more, blending it up, making congee, like pulverizing the food to death. I've tried all sorts of things to try to increase um, the digestibility of these foods, uh, particularly whole grains and beans and even nuts and seeds. But for some reason, I shit them out undigested no matter what. And during this time, I, my body freaks out, I get psoriasis, I get all sorts of problems. And what I found is the best remedy is just to, just to remove um, all of these foods. And in fact, what's really interesting, for some reason, um, the only foods that my body tends to digest very well and doesn't poop out the other end and cause problems for me are basically um, paleo foods or ketogenic foods, mostly keto, all, all the keto approved foods, um, or pretty much any food that's on the primal blueprint food pyramid, which happens to be a more lenient version of paleo. Um, not saying that everyone's like that, but that's just an example of, you know, optimizing nutrition for the individual. Now, the thing is, it does not mean that these other rules in level three don't apply. You know, uh, high glycemic load carbohydrates are most likely going to hurt most people, and some people are just lucky that they can get away with it. Um, you know, trans fats, uh, you know, hydrogenated oils and, and snack cakes and stuff are just not healthy. No one is a special snowflake. No one has just like magically um, developed biological adaptations to these industrialized processed foods. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, like, you know, um, everyone needs a different diet, so I just eat snack cakes and drink soda, and that's my healthy diet. Like, no. The general rules should apply to everyone. Um, you know, choosing healthy fats over, over um, processed fats and, and, and unhealthy fats, uh, getting enough essential nutrients such as uh, EPA and DHA omega-3. Uh, some people might even be able to argue that arachidonic acid can, is actually beneficial and even essential, possibly. Um, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, getting enough magnesium, potassium, sodium, enough protein and amino acids, things like that. Like, obviously, every single raw vegan <laughs> ends up looking like a malnourished homeless person with cancer. You know, that's just a given rule. Raw vegans, but cooked vegans tend to be able to do fine. So anyway, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to say like, you, you know, you're you can't just drink liters and liters of um, Crisco and expect to not develop heart disease. You can't just expect to drink gallons and gallons of of um, Coca Cola every day and expect to not get diabetes. Like you're gonna get diabetes, you know. But specialized diets has more to do with um, you know, how your intestines uh, deal with fiber, um, you know, your own gut microbiome, a lot of people might explain it as, um, you know, a lot of people, they develop psoriasis from nightshade vegetables, even nightshade vegetables can cause arthritis pain for a lot of people. Some people get arthritis pain uh, from brassica vegetables. Some people just get insane bloating and gas from a large portion of vegetables. Some people have autoimmune diseases and they found that the only way for them to treat the symptoms is by eating nothing but red meat. Um, and then obviously people, you know, for me, I like, I noticed um, when I eat a high carb diet, I have to use uh, tonic herbs in order to keep my mood stable and in order to, and, and to keep me, to get me to go to sleep. But when I switched to a ketogenic diet, immediately I, I was able to cut out all the supplements I was taking. Like I was taking uh, gynostema, holy basil, um, you know, and macuna, even for a while on keto. And what I found is I have 
way better sleep ever um, on keto. I have better mental clarity and I don't have um, mood swings or anything. I used to get like just not really mood swings, but I used to get really irritable. Like I, it was hard for me to control my frustration sometimes. Like when I was dealing with frustrating people, um, I suppose everyone has that problem where, where frustrating situations in life just overwhelm them uh, the more they deal with it. But I noticed on a ketogenic diet, I was able to, they weren't affecting me like damn near as much. I was able to, to just like let things go so much easier and stay calmer and sleep better. And so the point here is, and, and there's actually, um, again, dozens and dozens of studies that have shown um, benefits for bipolar disorder, benefits from, there's even case studies of remission of schizophrenia on um, ketogenic diets. And obviously epilepsy, even things like Alzheimer's disease, um, and depression and anxiety as well. There are studies that show ketogenic diets improve this. And so my point is not, oh, keto is God, although that is probably what it sounds like I'm saying because I do believe that that's the case. Um, but what I'm saying is for different diseases, food is, food is medicine and that's where the optimization comes into play. And so um, the thing is, in the mainstream, people don't realize how powerful nutrition is, don't realize that it can influence every single part of your life. And I think I just saw recently Mark Hyman made a TED talk talking about this, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, he made the book Ultra, The Ultramind Solution, and you should definitely get that book just to, to see how uh, food really impacts the brain. He goes into great detail on how brain chemicals are made, essentially. Um, your brain is literally made from the food you eat, so it makes a lot of sense. And so the best way to determine all of these things is by uh, studying the scientific literature um, to really find the truth of disease and to find different uh, population studies, but more importantly, find clinical trials. Actually look for clinical trials that compare different diets to each other and learn the ins and outs of how to interpret studies. For example, um, low carb diet in a study can mean 100 grams of carbs or more a day. So low carb diet studies are a lot of times flawed because low carb can mean many things. And ketogenic diets, on the other hand, are under 20 grams per day or under 50 grams on the higher end. So, you know, a study that says, oh, low carb diets increase your risk of dying, and then these people are eating 100 grams of carbs a day, yeah, that's not a good study on low carb diets at all. And then you also got to take into consideration what are the types of fats that these participants are eating. Um, you know, uh, are they restricting calories or not? What was their baseline? Um, and so there's a lot of really weird things that uh, scientists will do in studies to try to tweak the evidence. And so you gotta be aware of these things, um, whether you're a vegan or a keto person or not. Because a lot of these studies that keto people post, uh, or, or that vegan people post about the keto diet um, can be easily explained when you break down the methodology of the study and things like that. So anyway, as you can see, most people don't even wanna get to level four because it's just such a like mind, it's just so, it's such a hard thing. It's taken me four years to really get to the bottom of what causes heart disease, which I strongly believe it's low HDL, or, or what are the predictors for heart disease, let's put it that way. Low HDL, high triglycerides, high fasting blood glucose. I believe that those are the main risk factors. If you have low HDL, you have high triglycerides, right there, that's a big thing. And then as, obviously if you're, if you're overweight, if you are not physically active, if you are, if you smoke and you drink alcohol, um, then you have an even greater risk. Um, but the main thing is, you know, if you have a high HDL, uh, typically all of the things that I just mentioned, all the risk factors for heart disease influence HDL. So I do feel like high HDL is one of the greatest uh, signs that you have a low risk for heart disease. And typically, in order to get high HDL, you've got to have low triglycerides. It, it seem, they seem to be interchangeable. But you can have low triglycerides um, and low HDL. Um, anyway, 
Um, level five is going to be food quality, you know, organic versus conventional, grass fed, etc. Uh, I think that food quality is important, but I think uh, I don't think that food quality is a main thing people should be focusing on first. Uh, I think that if you have the money to buy organic and grass fed, I think that you should uh, invest in it. But uh, eating grass fed is not going to have a significant impact on, or you know, organic and grass fed is not going to have a significant impact on your blood markers of disease. The main blood markers of disease, triglycerides, HDL, even C-reactive protein, uh, these things are going to be mainly influenced by the glycemic load of your diet, by the types of fats that you're eating, and the amount of exercise you're getting as well. Uh, and so, and then the medic, if you're on any kind of medications, that can really mess with all of this. Um, so, you know, instead of worrying too much about, oh, like I don't have enough money for organic, so I'm just going to go and buy McDonald's every day. I've heard people say shit like that before. And it's just so retarded because, and, and you know, I use that word retarded just because it's just like a, uh, people get triggered when I say that, but. It's just ridiculous that uh, people use that as an excuse. Um, it doesn't make sense. Organic versus uh, organic is not going to really have an impact on your blood markers. Organic is not going to lower your triglycerides. You can have organic sugar, organic bananas. They're still going to be high glycemic load carbs. And, you know, so... Anyway, um, yeah, post your questions and comments down below. Um, if you watch this at two times speed, I really don't blame you because it's a long ass video. Um, hope this helped. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll talk to you all in the next video.